Good morning. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio, at the National First Ladies Historic Site. And I'm here today um, as part of our film discussion series. But before we get started, I wanna mention some upcoming programs going on. You might have seen the scrolling PowerPoint um, advertising some of them. So on Monday, we are hosting our monthly legacy lecture series. We have a really great talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. That is Monday at 10 a.m. Um, so if you're interested, check out our social media um, to get the Eventbrite to register for that. We also have a monthly STEAM kit that is inspired by different lady uh, scientists and it's called Ladies in the Lab. We are just uh, finishing up our October kit, which is inspired by Katherine Johnson. And next month we'll have a brand new scientist. So this is a great chance to take advantage of that. Um, we are also, besides hosting this film, um, coming up on November 11th, we're hosting a film with our friends at Stark Library that you can stream online called Served Like a Girl. Um, and our co-presenter uh, discussing the film will be Margaret DeLillo Story, who is a retired army officer. So we're really excited to have her. The documentary looks really fabulous. It's about women veterans and their experiences after they return to civilian life. Um, it all uh, wraps around this uh, Miss Veterans America competition. So it's a really cool upcoming film. Um, we also have another lecture coming up about um, women and first ladies on the campaign trail. Um, we will be going on a little field trip to Bowling Green University's Pop Culture Library uh, to take a look at their pin collection. So if you haven't made it to our education site um, in Canton, we have three different exhibitions up and one of them is about first ladies on the campaign trail. So if you're close by, you can check that out. It's free Free and open to the public. And the talk um, will be virtual November 13th at 10 a.m. And then we also have a book club and I am having a really hard time putting down this book. So if you wanna join us, it's not too late to sign up. November 19th, we're gonna be discussing The Invention of Wings by Sue Monk Kidd. And it's all about um, Sarah Grimke. Uh, it was really fascinating. Um, it is fictional, but weaves in a lot of abolitionist and um, suffrage history. So please check that out. And last but not least, we have some Christmas things coming up. If you can believe it or not, the holidays are right around the corner. And how better to celebrate the holidays um, than with the first ladies. So we have a really cool Betty Ford inspired craft class, as well as our talk with a curator series that is streamed on Facebook. Um, the Facebook talk will be December 17th, and it's going to involve uh, Nancy Reagan and the Reagan uh, Christmas card. So I think all of those will be really, really fun. So please follow us on social media and stay tuned to um, learn about more things coming up. So I'm so super excited to get started with our program today. Um, Britt Cherick is going to be our um, host uh, guest host today, panelists, and um, we're going to be talking about This Changes Everything, a documentary that if you haven't yet, you can stream through the Stark Library on their Hoopla site. Um, if you are out of state, go on our Eventbrite page and sign up and the Stark Library will send you a link to stream that. It's a really interesting documentary. And if you have not seen it, what we will do is start out with a little um, preview of the film so you can get a feel for it. And then I'll introduce Brett and we'll get started. Okay, give me one second. Remember the kids' books in the 50s, see Dick, see Jane. And I just felt like, you know, we see Dick all the time. <laughs> I just wanted to see more Jane. Media has the power to educate, to shape people's thoughts. It also has an incredible power when you get to see someone who's like you on screen. 
women's creative input is not making it into our nation's storytelling. Most of television and most of film is men making stuff for other men. We give them so few opportunities to feel inspired by the female characters. I've been one of those little girls looking for myself. You start to believe that there's something wrong with you. The door has to be open. We just want inclusion. The issue of discrimination against women was hurt by the federal government allowing the movie industry to do what they would want it to do. We have to all decide together that it's enough. When audiences decide I'm not going to see movies where women are belittled, things are going to change. I would hope it would be a wake-up call. We're all of us doing something really wrong. So, I'm sorry if the sound went out. I might have muted that accidentally. So sorry about any technical issues we may have had, but hopefully you got a chance to see a little bit of the film um, to better understand what it's about. And I'm just going to briefly introduce Britt Sherrick, our panelist today. Britt Sherrick is a high school English te teacher. She's an advocate for all things Akron gender equality and um, also interested in thoughtful writing and shopping local. Britt is a founding member of Pecha Kucha Akron and co-organizes the Midwest Craft Con, a biennial three-day retreat for crafters, makers, and creative entrepreneurs. As part of the Bechtel Film Fest, Britt and her team tell the stories of women and people of color and the LGBTQ community. So welcome, Britt. Thanks so much for making time to join us today. Thanks so much for asking me. I've been looking forward to it. I wanted to start by asking you um, for a little bit information, uh, more information about the Bechtel test and then about what the Bechtel test is, because that might be a, new to people. Yeah, um, so Bechtel Fest um, was a, a film festival that, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to win the Night Arts Challenge um, to be able to put together this film festival that was very female centric. Um, things are kind of on hold right now um, with the Bechtel Fest because of COVID, um, but I'm working closely still with the Nightlight Cinema, and um, we would like to resurrect some form of the festival um, next summer, um, even if it, it's just a, a film series, um, you know, and, it, and we still have to keep it drive in style. Um, but we would like to resurrect something, um, uh, and um, we're hoping to get people together again in the future. But I guess, should I explain what the Bechtel test is? you do that for us? Of course. Um, yeah, so the Bechtel uh, test, it's also called the Bechtel Wallace test because cartoonist Alison Bechtel um, actually got the idea from her friend, but she wrote a cartoon about it um, where it's a measure of representation of women in fiction. Um, it asks, uh, there's three criteria. So work needs to feature at least two women, they have to have names, who talked about, to each other about something and um, that something needs to be um, other than a man, um, which it's amazing how many films have been like knocked out of that category because they're the 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 problem, you know, all result revolves around what the men are doing, and that's the only thing the women are talking about. Can you give an example of a film that we would assume would pass the Bechtel test that doesn't? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, one thing that I found is um, with with documentaries, um, you would think. Like, you know, for example, um, for example, this changes everything might not pass it because you don't have two women talking to each other, even though it's all about that. So again, it's not a perfect measure, um, but uh, you know, there are, um, 
but it's it's a it's really important in terms of storytelling um, how to determine you know what is what is the focus you know um, and how women are being left out. And with the Bechdel Film Fest, you had a pretty great uh, variety of films, everything from the Lego Movie sequel <laughs> to um, I, I ended up seeing a really short documentary that might have been even made on a phone that was about a disabled woman and um, all the things that she deals with throughout the day. So that variety is really interesting and fascinating. But um, thinking about the Lego movie and thinking about children's movies, it was really fascinating to me the point that the film made and the research that Gina Davis has done about children and what they see on television. Um, and in children's TV, we heard that female characters are more likely to be depicted in leadership roles than male characters. Are, I believe male, male characters are more likely to be seen in leadership roles, sorry. Female and male characters were equally likely to be shown having an occupation in a STEM field. So all of these issues related to um, female characters that came up and how they were depicted in children's television was really interesting just because of the impact that children might have um, in digesting some of this information and uh, not seeing themselves reflected or themselves reflected in specific ways. Can you talk about or recommend to um, parents or caregivers out there films that you think are Bechdel test approved that are um, great for families? I think this would have been a harder question to answer five years ago, but honestly, the Gina Davis Institute, um, I've been following them for quite a while now, and it's really cool, like their annual reports as they got to the point where in children's programming, we, we have reached gender parity. Um, and then on top of it, we're also seeing more people of color and, and in dignified roles and not so not just a token. Um, same thing too with people with disabilities. Um, and so uh, I think a, a drawing attention to that is huge and super important. And again, this the work that the Gina Davis Institute has done and the fact that they have published their findings every year has really lit a fire under, uh, you know, the the industry as a whole. And I think that's really been helpful. But in terms of like some of my favorites, and I'm, and Allison, you know, we both have boys at home. And that's um, one of those things is, you know, I really do want my boys to grow up um, respecting everybody around them and looking at them as equals, or and even having role models that um, maybe aren't maybe our boys. And it is hard because, um, you know, from childhood, boys and girls are separated by gender so much. Um, and so one of the ways that we can do this is through media. So, I mean, we've got some really great, strong female characters. Um, you know, we love Moana in our house and, and Brave. But one of the, the ones that I really like, I really love when we see stories of, especially for my boys, to see stories of um, strong, um, male allies, or even, you know, these men who start to realize, like going through the realization that they haven't been treating another person fairly. And then you see that change, that redemption. And I think that's maybe something that um, is really important for our society when um, is that it's okay for people to make mistakes, but they have to, to do better. And I think that develops empathy. So, you know, we, I, I loved Cars 3. And that was another one that I showed at the Bechdel Fest, because you have this a male ally who realizes, oh, I haven't been an ally this whole time, and then helps his female character become the star of the film. So I also was really interested in what are some of the female identifying filmmakers that we should be looking for? Who should we be watching out there? You know what? There's so much right now. Um, I would say um, it depends on what genre you like, um, but I, um, I really enjoyed um, Dawn Porter's um, documentaries. Um, she did Good Trouble about John Lewis that came out this year. She also is doing um, a film that just came out about um, Pete Souza, who's a, a photographer um, who photographed the Reagan and the, um, the Obama White Houses. Um, and so that's been, I'm looking forward to seeing that one when it does come out. She also did a, a documentary in two, 
2016 called Trapped that talks about abortion laws. And it goes beyond just like the effect it has on women, but it, the effect it has on the community as a whole and on doctors and patients. And it, that one's a really good one if you haven't seen that. Um, if you're into drama, um, I'm... I'm trying to, of course, Greta Gerwig could do no wrong. And, um, you know, I was late to the Lady Bird train, but I just watched that over the summer and, oh, it's so good. Um, also, um, I've been, I would keep an eye out on um, Lulu Wang. She wrote a film, it either came out last year or this year, called The Farewell, and it's got Aquafina in it. And it's about just, just Chinese culture and how different it is for, you know, um, reconciling between traditional Chinese culture, and then the culture of young Chinese Americans. Um, and it was so beautiful. It was just so well done. So I'm curious to see what she'll come up with in the future. Um, let's see the, oh, um, if you're into action, I'm shocked how many like, you know, shows that like my husband is into that are like action or like comic book style that are directed by women at this point, you know, um, like uh, um, we watched Watchmen on HBO and more than half of the episodes are directed by women. Um, the Old Guard, that's, which is a Netflix movie, another action film, um, it was directed by Gina Prince Blythewood. Um, and then of course you've got, um, it's nice to, to see more women writing the rom-coms and, and the lighthearted things because you have more complex you know, female characters as opposed to just being the pretty love interest. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I've got, um, you know, a tween son, you know, an 11 year old and I, he, he is like on board with watching rom-coms with me. So the ones we've been, that we've loved are um, To All the Boys I've Loved Before on Netflix, which is a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but again, these characters are more complex. Um, and uh, I really loved uh, Late Night which was written by Mindy Kaling, has Emma Thompson in it. And it was um, directed by uh, Nisha Ganatra, who also worked on Transparent um, and did some great directing there. Um, it's been really cool to see um, so much, uh, so many women directing uh, in television, being that's kind of what more people are watching now due to COVID. So it's kind of nice that that those that field, those streaming services were supporting women and people of color, you know, before any of this happened. I don't know, especially after watching This Changes Everything. Part of me thinks it might be some kind of karma for Hollywood that they treated women so poorly. And now, I mean, nobody's going to the movies now. So um, it's nice that these streaming services are doing that. Yeah, I, I really wanted, I was glad that you mentioned Transparent because uh, Joey Soloway is in the, oh, the documentary and I am such a fan. That's one of my favorites. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about has how COVID has impacted the film industry, both on a local level, thinking about your film fest and the nightlight, mm -hmm. Cleveland um, Film Fest, mm -hmm. all having to kind of stand still to on a national and international level. Um, big movie chains are closing down. How do you think that will impact um, gender equity? It seems like there's a real issue for women, especially women who are caregivers right now uh, and pulling out of the workforce. I'm wondering if this will set women back in the film industry as well. You know, well, and, and much to that point, all industries have to adapt right now. Our entire economy has to adapt. I mean, things are changing and this isn't going away, um, even though, even if we have been really hoping that's the case. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say that the bright side is that like these streaming services like Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, they've all been supporting women and um, bio, bi pick, bi, you know, like a, a people of color directors before COVID hit. Um, and so the fact that they're continuing to support and, and make an effort to have a broad range of storytelling. You know, it's even cool when you pull up the streaming service, um, even like if you pull up the kids uh, media on Netflix, like they have all those categories and they do have sharing stories of people of color. And it's not just in front of the camera, it is, you know, uh, directors and things like that. Um, I do think that I can't wait to get back to the movies. I don't think that there's an experience that's quite like that. We have gone to the drive-in a few times um, and I'm really excited that um, 
the nightlight has started, and the nightlight is uh, the indie movie cinema in Akron, um, that they have been doing some outdoor uh, showings uh, towards the end of the summer. And I, I think that that's an experience that we're not, we as a culture are not ready to get rid of because it is important. You know, you go and you have this shared experience with these other people that, and you're, you're moved by the storytelling, but we might have to drive a little further to get to the local movie theater because of this, because of this big hit. Um, but I don't think that that's gonna go away. I am a little nervous about this idea of, um, you know, but I think that because so much attention is drawn to this, I think that we are seeing more equity in terms of the, the where the jobs are. You know, I think that many more women are in the film industry than were a couple of years ago. And, and of course, a lot of jobs are lost, but I think both men and women are losing those jobs and, and are being um, innovative to, um, you know, help us. Cause, cause right now we, we, we do need an escape, right? from, I mean, COVID fatigue is real. So, you know, it's nice to have entertainment. And so I don't see um, that being an issue. Yeah, the, the film industry will find ways to thrive. And again, the fact that we have these streaming services already in place and they're already making lots of money and uh, hiring lots of women and people of color, you know, and telling these dynamic stories, I think that that's a good thing. And, um, you know, I feel bad about the hit, but I also think that, we're just going to keep moving on. And, and I, I, I'm, maybe it's just that I'm a hopeful person, but I do see a lot of good things happening. So one thing that really struck me about the film, and I'm not an expert on film history, but was women's role in filmmaking. So in the early days of cinema, when silent movies were coming along, uh, women played a really big role in screenwriting and some directing. And then finally, as talkies appeared, on the scene, women disappeared from the director's chair as soon as the studio system was developed. Mm -hmm. And these bigger conglomerates decided that they could make money off of film. I'm wondering what sort of research and what you know, or like reaction you had to that. Was that surprising to you to hear that history? Uh, you know what? <laughs> we as a society, this is nothing new. We've been profiting off women's work for since since the beginning of time. So I wasn't surprised. I was, uh, I didn't know that before I watched the documentary actually, um, but they did, I love how the, it, this, the documentary brought this narrative to life. And I don't wanna give away like too much for people who haven't seen the movie yet, but um, of course it has to do with money, right? As soon as it became something that was profitable, because you know, when it's, oh, you know, the, the women have their arts and crafts and their, their cute little projects that they can do and that makes them feel good about themselves. And that's how the men viewed this whole, what has become this huge industry, you know? Um, and so it once that you're, you're, you're exactly, you hit the nail on the head, as soon as the movies started making money and these studios became established, of course the men wanted to be in power and they wanted to be in control of what stories they told. And they of course wanted to make that money too. Um, and so women were pushed out. So. Um, uh, uh, it was unfair, but the thing that's so infuriating is how far this went and how, um, women have been pushed out and kept out, you know, well through, you know, the, you know, this is only the Gina and Davis Institute has only been around for five or six years, um, and actually been drawing attention to that. And even just in those five or six years, we have made so many strides, but there is a huge gap where, yeah, where the, the voices of women are not presented to a large audience. And that's, I mean, that's shameful. The other storyline of the film that was completely fascinating that I didn't know about at all was the um, Directors Guild. And mm -hmm. that women who were members of the Directors Guild got together and started to pull numbers and, and looked into going to the federal government 
and um, filing a discrimination lawsuit, which was really, really interesting and fascinating. And it's kind of been this really an ongoing battle. And one yeah. of the great things in it was, you've been talking about male allies, was um, more recently, one of the people who became a hero was the head of FX. So um, a, a film critic w I was doing research on um, women in films and the representation of female directors and showrunners and saw that FX was the absolute worst when it came to showcasing women, people of color. And instead of getting really angry, this guy went back and said, how can we do better? What can we do? And he fixed it. And um, it was so cool to hear from the journalists too and say like, I didn't think anything would come out of this. Yeah. I just started putting the numbers together and this is what I found and how great that she helped make that happen and he made that change. Yeah, I know. And that those are things that were kind of problematic about the Me Too movement because then it led to this cancel culture where like, oh, is anybody safe? You know, am I, when can I go back and movies because of a mistake they made in the past but it was also hard to see the reactions of a lot of these people who were these artists that you know we admired and and instead of standing up and doing better you know but those are scary consequences to face you know if I mean if if uh the statute of limitations hasn't passed so um and I, do, I actually like that you brought up critics because that is another issue that we see is that there are are very few female film critics and very, very few critics um, of color or, so the thing is, even if the movies are getting better and the entertainment is still getting better, we need to see it um, rated and we need to see it through the, you know, we need to see our previews list through the eyes of more than just the white male gaze. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably the, one of the next things on the list of advocacy roles is uh, trying to get more women into um, appointment uh, you know, to, to be critics and um, to have their point of view displayed. Emily Nussbaum at the New Yorker is one of my absolute favorites. Okay. Her so much. So, um, but what can we do as viewers uh, to make the film industry more accountable, to make um, them include more people and more diversity? What, what kinds of suggestions do you have as someone who has worked towards that? Um, yeah, we just need to keep paying attention. You know, we need to keep doing this. Um, that's one thing um, I have seen. Yeah, so the, the film's title, this changes everything. But then, you know, when, when it's talking about the Thelma and Louise movie, right, that this changes everything. But it didn't change anything. It was just, um, I mean, of course, I'm sure it inspired generations of girls, you know, and, but at the same time, nothing's changed. So, you know, I just read recently, you know, as a parallel, I read a poll that, you know, um, it's somewhere around 60% of white Americans right now, you know, actually are supporting, still supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, which is down significantly from the spring and summer when, you know, national brands were using this as a marketing, marketing tactic that they were part of the Black Lives Matter and they support this movement. Um, and I think it, we just have to remember that people do have an emotional response to things and they have very short memories. And so if this is something that you want to prioritize, then keep doing it. Um, instead of going to see a film that is directed by a man, see a film that's directed by a woman. And this goes with everything. Like if I've made a big effort um, to read, um, you know, I'm a big reader. So I've made an effort to once every month, I want to read um, a book that's by a woman of color. And there's so there's, we have lots of choice. So we should do that. One thing I would love to see is I would love to see people more active in women's sports. I would love to see people like betting on women's sports, getting a fantasy, you know, um, soccer, uh, women's national soccer team uh, league going. And I think that one, if, if we keep making those steps forward, um, then the culture can change, but we just, it, it's all individual people who need to make those choices and do things. Um, and that's how we'll be able to get to 
making it normal, you know? And I think that we're making some right steps, but it's just a matter of sending those reminders. And that's why I love what the Gina Davis Institute is doing because they are publishing those numbers regularly and saying, um, this is where we need to do better. And so as individuals, we need to put our money where our mouth is and support what we want to see more of and what we want our kids to see more of. One thing that's so great about films is they put you in another person's shoes. They help you to feel empathy and mm -hmm. to see so many films out there that center Black people, people of color, other voices that aren't just about experiences of slavery or civil rights, but something like uh, Lovecraft Country, which is very subtly about civil rights and about mm -hmm. racism, but also works different genres in. So thinking about horror films, I think is, is really, really interesting too. Absolutely. So, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because you're the second person to recommend that. That's on our list, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's one of those things where we have to stay up later than the kids to be able to watch it. I know. That is... <laughs> My struggle every night. I really want to stay up and watch TV. Um, <laughs> so I I love that I, I didn't know until I watched the film. I was like, this changes everything. What is that about? But that Thelma and Louise, that idea that that film was going to change everything and suddenly women's stories were going to become part of the forefront, that things were going to change, and it didn't. Um, <laughs> and that like critic or that feel that mindset of like okay here it is like everyone's saying this is going to change things and now it isn't so you briefly brought up the me too movement it's definitely seems like uh, this changes everything um some of the civil unrest related to the pandemic that came up seems like a, this changes everything moment do you think this will change everything or do you I think that it's another I think it's just, it is. And, and that's, again, people do have these short memories. Like, I mean, I still know, you know, women who marched in the women's march who aren't thinking about, um, but they're, they're, there's, people are worried about things when it affects them. And honestly, I think that's another reason why I'm kind of putting, I wanted to kind of put back to fest on hold is um, because I need to make sure that any steps that I'm making um, focusing on women um, are definitely intersectional, right? That it's also, it's not just elevating women, but it's also elevating all marginalized groups with us. So making sure that we do have people with disabilities, the LGBTQ community, uh, just, just people of color, everybody. Um, I think that those stories do need to be told. Um, and it's it's gonna take a lot of advocacy and um, you know that and that's what will change everything is if this advocacy continues and you know we keep uh, organ we keep supporting organizations like the Gina Davis Institute who are actually drawing attention to these things um, and they have the data to back it up. The other thing too is um, I love that you brought up this idea how stories create empathy. You know, that's one of the beautiful things that, you know, in my, my other role as a teacher, you know, I love the idea that the fact that I'm able to start dismantling the um, typical canon curriculum, which granted, um, and then when we do look at some of these stories, you know, um, you know, I, I still consider some of these, you know, we still teach the classics, you know, like of mice and men, like the fact that that was so, the fact that the way wom women were treated in that book and the way that they were ignored also says a lot about, um, you know, can also be feminist in a way. So of course it's not gonna pass the Bechdel test, but when you see the behavior of that and you develop empathy for that character, you know, you can, you can see what is wrong by seeing what's missing. And I think that kids nowadays are catching on to that more, probably because they've had programming um, and media that has been more balanced and think, wow, I can't believe they would treat women like that, you know? Um, although I will say that, you know, going back and trying to show my son some of the movies that I loved when I was younger, it's, I mean, you forget, you forget what movies were like in the 90s and how 
dismissive of women. Um, and, you know, but that also brings up good conversations. Um, although we, we, let's see, we watched, we watched Adam's Family Values um, and that one holds up. Uh, and uh, so I was, that one we enjoyed. Um, but, you know, there were some things, you know, we watched Back to the Future and, you know, you think of that and it, that's still, a, it's a great film, it's beautiful, but it's, uh, the way that women are treated is not as uh, is not how I remembered, but I wasn't looking at it through that lens. Mm -hmm. One another thing that the film tackles is awards and this idea that only one woman has ever won the Oscar for directing, and that the way that we look at awards and the way that we experience films as being important or artful is through the lens of a male experience and that the film that won was extremely it was about war it was about right. male experience yeah. so i wonder if you could speak to to that a little bit about awards and how they impact uh, the way we think well, about films i mean first of all the fact that we categorize by gender is problematic like uh, it, it, not just in awards but like anything you know and and our culture is changing um and, you know, but there is so much resistance to it, right? Like, well, we couldn't, but at the same time, actors and actresses do the same job. So why are we separating? Why don't we just have a best actor and a female actor could win that, you know? Um, uh, my husband jokes that Meryl Streep would win. Nobody would ever win an Oscar ever again if we did that, um, but, uh, or no man. But at the same time, I don't see a problem with that. Um, and I would, and I, th I think that the industry does know that they have to change um, and that they're, the fact that we have these, you know, what were scrappy companies like Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that have gotten into the film and the fact that they are supporting people and the fact that we're like living in the golden age of television and, you know, the studios are no longer the gatekeepers of what we, what the stories are told and what stories are presented, I think is a really good sign. Um, uh, but in terms of, I mean, and there's a lot of criticism of, you know, the Academy. And so, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes, if, if it does shake things up. Um, and, you know, I, again, I'm hopeful, um, but I'm also realistic. I don't, I think it's going to take time but I think that we shouldn't be letting up. I think that we should be continuing to advocate and to, to criticize. Um, and I think that hopefully that will change some things and you know, maybe, and I would be happy that a generation from now, you know, uh, my grandkids are watching something completely different. We mentioned um, movie, the way we screen movies changing, but we didn't mention the way that we make movies and the way kids have access. So having a phone allows us to make a film or mm -hmm. using a platform like TikTok could get us millions and millions of views in a way. Mm -hmm. When we were children, we didn't have access to any of that to make yeah. a film or to think about it. You had to have a lot of money. You had a lot of access to technology that you don't need to now. How do you think that will impact things? You know, and I think about, you know, when I first like found my posse of women on the internet when I was a teenager, you know, through like live journal and, you know, then MySpace and stuff and um, how eye opening that was for me because, you know, I was real into punk rock and I didn't even know there were girl punk rock bands until I found other girl punk rockers. And, you know, that was so eye opening. Um, and then, you know, finding my niche of people who recommended books and movies and stuff. Um, and so I think that kids probably have more access and it's gonna be easier for them to like kind of find their people. But what's scary is that there's also so, there's so much uncurated, unedited stuff out there that, and that's the other thing too. Like the other day I was like looking over my kid's shoulder as he's on YouTube and every other um, video had like a campaign ad, had like an ad for Donald Trump on there. And I was like, I mean, and clearly they're targeting like these kids because he's watching videos about, you know, playing Minecraft or whatever. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting to see where that'll go. Um, I'm hopeful, you know, that because we're living in the way age of information that kids do have access to better programming, 
but the answer might be that they just have access to more programming. So I think it's still going to take advocacy on the parents' part to, you know, guide them towards these stories that, you know, have good messages. You mentioned a political person, and I, because we're the First Ladies Library, I wanted to mention the impact of First Ladies on film. Um, so Hillary Clinton is in the process of possibly producing the Women's Hour, the Obamas have a deal with Netflix, and they've made documentaries, they made a really great documentary, I forget what it was called, but about um, disability in a camp that was for disabled kids. Um, I remember reading that one of the Obama kids was working in the film industry and interning. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really interested to see if this will become a first lady cause in the future too. Oh, um, that'd be cool. That's kind of interesting and exciting. And the last question, or one of the last things I wanted to talk about, the film also, um, another term that I had never heard of was the CSI effect that, if women see other women in different jobs in TV and the film industry, that um, girls will start to take on those roles. So after the CSI show was developed and on television, women started to enter that field. And that was never seen before. Um, an example that I know of just working at the First Ladies Library is Mae Jemison, that she saw an African-American woman on Star Trek and not seeing a, a astronaut that looked like her, she made that connection and it helped inspire her to become an astronaut. So do you think that there's a show out there or a field that um, is going to be greatly influenced by something on television or in the media right now? Well, and they, 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 I've also heard it called the Scully effect, you know, from the X-Files and that there are so many more women in science that were, um, they were inspired by her because she was a smart, critical character, you know, um, and I actually can personally relate to this. Um, when I, uh, I actually went into aviation when I was like just out of high school, I like was taking flight lessons and stuff and I, um, was working on my private pilot's license. And I was actually the first girl that was hired at the Akron Fulton Airport to do line service. So I was like fueling planes and I was towing them in and out of the airport, the hangars and things like that. And it was really cool. And I was really honored to be the first woman, but it was also like my first experience really being up submerged into a boys club, you know? And um, that was a little difficult, you know, like I got called toots by these old guys who wanted me to, you know, fuel their plane or they just thought I was, they didn't take me seriously. And that was really difficult. And I did get to the point where I was able to like did solo and I did, I never finished my pilot's license um, just cause uh, well, I don't have very good eyesight. And so like the military wasn't really an option for me. Um, and there, I mean, there were other things and, and I'm fine with where I ended up but it was such a shocker to me that um, the, the way that that industry is. So I would love to see more women in aviation. I actually have a student in high school who's taking uh, lessons right now. So I'm trying to really be encouraging to her. Um, and I, but I think it's really important because we, you know, men shouldn't have to like be like, oh, there's a lady in the room. I shouldn't talk like this. Like those spaces should exist for everyone, you know, um, just like, you know, we shouldn't, and I try to be conscious of that, you know, when we, uh, like, would a person say this if there was a person of color in here, like we, though, that's, that's something that people should be cautious, uh, conscious of, and that um, kids should be trained to understand that um, you shouldn't have to code swap, you know, that these spaces should be places where anyone can exist and anyone can do that job. So, um, yeah, I love seeing stuff like that. Even like, you know, we watch a lot of PBS kids in my house. And so seeing those clips in between where, you know, you have um, where they're just highlighting different careers. And yeah, sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a black man, sometimes it's, and they're just highlighting all these different jobs. And uh, the catchphrase is you could be anything. And I love Gina Davis. Um, if you follow the Institute on social media at all, um, their hashtag is, if she can see it, she can be it. Um, and again, see Jane. So, um, and that's so important, like to let kids get exposed to that. And the fact that we know it's research-based, the fact that we've seen this effect actually happen and we have data correlating it should encourage um, people who, again, are those gatekeepers to encourage um, more diverse roles, especially in 
uh, in terms of those kind of advanced positions? I just watched Teenage Bounty Hunters, which is a show on Netflix. I think it just got canceled, but I was thinking about that because it follows two sisters who are teenagers who become bounty hunters accidentally. And like, oh, wow, is this going to open up a field change for women as bounty hunters? So I think that was really interesting. I had never heard that term before. Uh, so that was really fascinating. Well, Britt, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know that you're at school today and super busy, so I'm glad that you could fit us into your schedule. And I want to encourage everyone out there to check out our film for the month, This Changes Everything. You can go to First Lady's Library's um, Eventbrite page to register to watch the film and link up with Hoopla through the Stark Library if you haven't seen the film yet and check out the Gina Davis Institute as well as the Bechtel Film Fest um, for more information on women in the film industry. So thank you so much, Britt. And I wanna encourage everyone to also check out and sign up for Serve Like a Girl, which is our film next month. We'll be screening on Veterans Day for a great discussion as well. So thank you so much, Britt Cherick, for joining us. And having um, me. Yeah, this has been wonderful. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.